We're getting very near to Christmas now and we're beginning to think of the Christmas story. Schools are beginning to get their nativity plays ready and the Christmas cards are coming and they'll have angels on and there'll be little angels who aren't always little angels in those nativity plays and we shall be facing this subject and when we read the story of Christmas in say Luke's Gospel we discover that the angels are an integral part of the story. You just can't get very far with Christmas without thinking about the angels. The whole story is full of angels. And yet I suppose that when we take down the fairy lights and put the decorations away and throw the Christmas cards in the dustbin, or better still, wrap them up in a bundle and bring them to Commercial Road for the waste paper effort. <laughs> After we've done all that, I'm afraid many of us will put angels out of our thinking for another 12 months. And the debate between one Christmas and the next seems to resolve itself into a rather crude questioning as to whether somewhere out in the universe there is intelligent life. Whenever I hear people discussing this, I want to laugh, I want to tell them, the Bible said 2,000 years ago that we are not the only intelligent beings in the universe. We are limited to earth, but out there, there are myriads of intelligent beings. The universe is not empty, it only looks empty to our telescopes. It was one of the first Russian astronauts, was it Titov, one of them, who went out into space and came back and when the press reporters gathered round, they said, what did you see up there? And he said, well, I didn't see any angels and threw back his head and roared with laughter as he drank his vodka. But I wanted to say to that man, but they saw you. Now, we must get out of our eye heads the idea that angels are beautiful creatures with long white nighties and beautifully fair curly hair and blue eyes and hearts and wings and all the rest. There are some elements of truth in this and maybe, maybe they look a little like this when we see them in heaven. But this kind of fairy appearance is such that nobody could ever have entertained an angel unawares. And the Bible does say quite simply that some people have done and without realizing it, they've had an angel in their home. Well, certainly if you opened your front door and there was a, a vision of that sort in front of you, you'd have no doubts at all. They are not people who've died and turned into angels the other side of the grave. The Bible never gives any ground whatever for thinking that we become angels when we die. No, let's get it quite straight. The angels and human beings are quite separate they have no direct connection with each other. They were created separately. They're different orders of being. And the angels will never become men, actually, nor will the men actually ever become angels. Thirdly, let's look at their function. They are not mediators between men and God. They are not to be worshipped or prayed to. At least twice in the last book in the Bible, angels tell John don't fall down and worship me. I am just a servant of God as you are. We are not to confuse angels with any other than messengers of God. They are simply his messenger boys to take his words, to do his bidding wherever they go. Bible teaches that angels are a distinct order of beings between men and God. Not mediators, but an order of creatures superior to men inferior to God. Superior to men because they are stronger than we are, they are more beautiful than we are, they are more intelligent than we are. They are not born as we are born, they do not grow up as we grow up, they are not married as we marry, they do not have children as we have children. So their number is fixed by God who made them. He created them and they have stayed that way since. They are spirits and they do not have bodies of flesh though they do have the power to appear as bodies. They do not die as we all die. They belong to heaven and not earth. Yet they are inferior to God. They do not share his power. They do not share his knowledge. He alone is almighty and he alone is all knowing. And they are not eternal. There was a time when they were not and they were created. There are countless numbers of angels in the universe. 10,000 times 10,000. The word host is the biggest number of people you can get in the Hebrew language. 
There are titles and grades and ranks and names among them. There are archangels, cherubim, seraphim, principalities, powers. Some of them are named. Gabriel, Michael and Lucifer are named within the pages of Holy Scripture. They are not omniscient, they don't understand everything, but they are far more intelligent than men. They know what is going on on earth, they know what is happening in your life. Much more than anyone else, the angels know. Perhaps the most important thing this book says about the angels is that there are good ones and bad ones in the proportion of two to one, that a third of the angels of heaven have rebelled against God and have decided to try and take his kingdom from him. Tonight I want to talk about the good ones. Through the ministry of Jesus, you discover the angels stepping in at point after point. When he was tempted and alone with the wild beasts and the devil in the wilderness, who helped him through that? We're told that the angels came and ministered to him. With wild beasts around him and the devil in front of him, the angels came to support him. There was one occasion when he was going through a village and they were rude to Jesus. And they shouted and they said, get out of our village, we don't want you. And the disciples said, what shall we do? They deserve fire from heaven. Shall we pray for that? And Jesus said, don't you realize that I have 10,000 angels just waiting to do what I tell them? If I wanted to blot them out, I'd just call the angels to come. They'd deal with them. 10,000 angels followed Jesus through his Galilean ministry and he could have called on any of them at any moment. Go to the Garden of Gethsemane. Once again he was all alone. The disciples were asleep. Who helped him through that dreadful agony when the drops of sweat became as blood on his brow? Who helped him through? It says the angels came and ministered to Jesus. There is only one crisis in our Lord's life when the angels didn't come and help. And that was when he was all alone on the cross. Not an angel in sight. The sun had gone out. God had departed. The God of light had gone. And gross darkness came over the earth for three hours. There's not an angel anywhere. An angel could have pulled the nails out. An angel could have blasted those priests and those Jews and Romans to eternity as easily as I speak to you now. But no angel came. No help. The 10,000 legions, legion of angels were silent. Ten legions of them stayed away. But who rolled away the stone from the tomb? No human being touched that stone. One angel came down and it's estimated that the stone weighed a ton and a quarter and an angel rolled it, pushed it and sat on it according to the Bible. That's the strength of an angel. Just rolled it away, sat on the stone. And when the bewildered disciples came, they said, Where is he? Where's he gone? Where's the body? And it was angels who conveyed the message, Don't look for a living saviour in a cemetery. He's not here. Why seek the living among the dead? Go and tell the disciples, he'll see you in Galilee. And when the moment came for Jesus to go back to heaven, as they stayed gazing up into the clouds, angels came and they said why are you still looking up into heaven he's gone but he's coming back in the same way now you go back into Jerusalem and wait as he told you he said if just one person comes to Christ if just one person repents of sin and accepts Christ as Savior the angels in heaven will start singing they'll sing their heads off do you know that means that the angels are watching this service tonight they know all about it. They know what's going on. They know you're here. They know I'm here. The hosts of God are around us. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we lord and magnify thy glorious name. And if one person went out of this building tonight believing in Jesus, who came into it a sinner who didn't know the Savior, the angels are going to be talking about it. They're going to be singing about it. They're going to be saying, do you know what happened at Commercial Road tonight? One sinner repented and has come into the family. I was taught as a child to think of angels by my bed. I'm afraid I dismissed that when I grew up and I thought, oh, what a silly idea. Angels by my bed, that's like fairies down the garden. Now I know it's true. Now I know that you can go to bed and you can say, oh, God of hosts, 
guard me while I sleep. Love that story when Elisha wasn't worried about all the enemy round about. They were on a hill, the hill of Dothan. And the servant woke up in the morning and looked out and said, Master, what shall we do? We're completely surrounded. They've come for you. And Elisha said, it's all right. Oh Lord, let the young man see what the real situation is. And when he looked again, between the outer circle of the Syrians and Elisha, the man of God, was another circle of God's chariots. And as the Syrians advanced towards Elisha, the angels touched the eyes of the Syrians and they couldn't see. And the whole situation was saved. The ministry of protection. Let me be right down to earth again. Who shut the lion's mouths in Daniel's den? I used to be brought up on the idea that they didn't eat Daniel because most of him was backbone and the rest was grit. I don't think that's borne out by the scripture. It tells you in the scripture that an angel came and shut the lion's mouth. Can you imagine that? An angel strong enough to hold the jaws of the king of the jungle together. An angel came. It wasn't that the lions were all peaceful and quiet and just lying around Daniel as Sunday school pictures portray. They wanted to eat him up. They were hungry. They were savage. But you can't eat anyone when someone's holding your jaws tight shut. An angel came and held the jaws tight shut. The angels of God can protect you. In the New Testament too, you find the same ministry. You find a ministry of deliverance. Here's a disciple of Christ chained in the inner prison with four guards and then a locked gate and he's in prison. But what is a padlock to an angel? An angel is a marvelous one for picking locks. And Peter woke up in the middle of the night and an angel had opened the, the, key, the chain and it had gone. And the angel said, shh, quickly get dressed, come on. And out past the guards, past the guards, fast asleep, came to the barred doors and as they walked towards them, the doors opened. There's a lovely humorous touch then. Peter made his way to the Christians who ha were having a prayer meeting. And they were all praying, Lord, get Peter out of prison. Praying like mad. And then there was a knock at the door and the maid went and she came back and she said, it's Peter. And they said, it can't be. We're praying for him. He's in prison. And they just couldn't believe it. But you see, angels can get a man out of prison. Do you know I have heard so many stories in recent years of angels protecting, delivering, providing for God's people. Sometimes it is necessary for us to see them, sometimes it is not. But we can claim their presence. We can go to bed tonight saying, angels guard me while I sleep. We can get up tomorrow morning and whatever danger you're facing, whatever responsibility you're facing, Whatever you're afraid of, you can say, Oh God of hosts, encamp around me, because I fear you. And if you fear God, you fear nothing and no one else. And I will tell you this to close, that one day you're all going to meet the angels. One day you'll believe in them, one day you'll see them, because one day you're going to die, and one day I can't help you, and one day your family can't help you. One day you're going on a journey by yourself, and there's a story in this book of a poor beggar. His name was called Lazarus, which means a man who loves God. Nobody else loved him, had nothing to eat and nowhere to live. And he lived on the pavement all by himself. And he would just love the crumbs that the rich people used to use to clean their hands. They didn't use serviettes. They took a piece of bread and they rubbed their hands clean on the bread and threw it under the table. He'd love to have eaten that. But he couldn't. And he died. And the man whom no one had cared for all his life was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The day you take your journey alone, the day when human beings can't help you anymore, God has the angels waiting just the other side. They'll show you around. They'll take you where you need to be. One day the Lord Jesus is coming back from glory and everybody will see him. The whole world will see Jesus. They'll know that he's Lord. But I'm told at least three times in the Bible that when he comes, he's going to come with his angels and we'll see them all. And we'll see the angels with Jesus. And we'll know they're real. And we'll know they're true. 
and so will the whole wide world. isn't it thrilling to approach christmas and believe in angels?